Good morning. It's terrific to be here and wonderful to see such a terrific crowd. I'm, uh, I've been told to talk to you about my book, Why I'm a Hindu. Uh, but what I think I'll do is to make the speech a little shorter than the organizers had wanted in order to have more of an exchange with you. I saw the lively questions coming up at the end of the last session and so many more hands than could be reached. So let's see if we can accommodate more of you and have more of an exchange. But I'll try and lay out a few things and then perhaps go into that conversational mode with you. Um, and I thought, frankly, the best way to introduce my book to this audience would be to start with to read a couple of pages from the very beginning, which capture some of the concerns and the tone uh, of the work, and then perhaps to tell you a little bit more uh, about uh, the issues that I'm I'm interested in, in exploring in this book. So this is how the book begins, the first chapter. Why am I a Hindu? The obvious answer to this question is, of course, that it's because I was born one. Most people have little choice about the faith they grew up with. It was selected for them at birth by the accident of geography and their parents' cultural moorings. The overwhelming majority of Hindus in the world were born Hindu. A small handful, inspired by marriage, migration, or philosophical conviction, have adopted the faith, usually by a process of conversion unknown to most Hindus. Unlike that small minority, I was never anything else. I was born a Hindu, grew up as one, and have considered myself one all my life. But what does being a Hindu mean? Many of us began having to interrogate ourselves in the late 1980s, when the world media first began to speak and write of Hindu fundamentalism. This was odd, because we knew of Hinduism as a religion without fundamentals. No founder or prophet, no organized church, no compulsory beliefs or rites of worship, no uniform conception of the good life, no single sacred book. My Hinduism was a lived faith. It was a Hinduism of experience and upbringing, a Hinduism of observation and conversation, not one anchored in deep religious study, though of course the two are not mutually exclusive. I knew a few mantras, just a few snatches of a couple of hymns, and practically no Sanskrit. My knowledge of Hindu sacred texts and philosophies came entirely from reading them in English translation. When I went to a temple, I prayed in an odd combination of English, Sanskrit, and my mother tongue, Malayalam, instinctively convinced that an omniscient God would naturally be multilingual. <laughs> Skipping a paragraph here. The first challenge, of course, was definitional. The name Hindu itself denotes something less and more than a set of theological beliefs. In many languages, French and Persian amongst them, the word for Indian is Hindu. Originally, Hindu simply meant the people beyond the river Sindhu or Indus. But the Indus is now in Islamic Pakistan. And to make matters worse, the word Hindu did not exist in any Indian language till its use by foreigners gave Indians a term for self-definition. Hindus, in other words, call themselves by a label they didn't invent themselves in any of their own languages but adopted cheerfully when others began to refer to them by that word. Of course, many prefer a different term altogether, Sanatan Dharma or eternal faith, which I do discuss later, but not in what I'm going to read to you. Hinduism is thus the name that foreigners applied to what they saw as the indigenous religion of India. It embraces an eclectic range of doctrines and practices, from pantheism to agnosticism, from faith in reincarnation to belief in the caste system. But none of these constitutes an obligatory credo for a Hindu. There are none. We have no compulsory dogmas. This is, of course, rather unusual. A Catholic is a Catholic because he believes Jesus was the Son of God who sacrificed himself for man. A Catholic believes in the Immaculate Conception and the Virgin Birth, offers confession, genuflects in church, and is guided by the Pope and a celibate priesthood. A Muslim must believe that there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is his prophet. A Jew 
cherishes his Torah, or Pentateuch, and his Talmud. A Parsi worships at a fire temple. A Sikh honors the teachings of the Guru Granth Sahib above all else. There is no Hindu equivalent to any of these statements. There are simply no binding requirements to being a Hindu, not even a belief in God. I grew up in a Hindu household. Our home always had a prayer room where paintings and portraits of assorted divinities jostled for shelf and wall space with fading photographs of departed ancestors, all stained by ash scattered from the incense burned daily by my devout parents. I've written before of how my earliest experiences of piety came from watching my father at prayer. Every morning after his bath, my father would stand in front of the prayer room, wrapped in his towel, his wet hair still uncombed, and chant his Sanskrit mantras. But he never obliged me to join him. He exemplified the Hindu idea that religion is an intensely personal matter, that prayer is between you and whatever image of your maker you choose to worship. In the Hindu way, I was to find my own truth. I think I have. I am a believer, despite a brief period of schoolboy atheism, of the kind that comes with the discovery of rationality and goes with an acknowledgement of its limitations. And I'm happy to describe myself as a believing Hindu, not just because it's a faith into which I was born, but for a string of other reasons, though faith requires no reason. One reason is cultural. As a Hindu, I belong to a faith that expresses the ancient genius of my own people. I'm proud of the history of my faith in my own land, of the travels of Adi Shankara, who journeyed from the southernmost tip of the country to Kashmir in the north, Gujarat in the west, Odisha in the east, debating spiritual scholars everywhere, preaching his beliefs, establishing his mutts. I'm reaffirmed in this atavistic allegiance by the Harvard scholar Diana Eck, writing of the sacred geography of India, knit together by countless tracts of pilgrimage. The great philosopher president of India, Dr. Sarvepalli Radhakrishnan, wrote of Hindus as a distinct cultural unit with a common history, a common literature, and a common civilization. In reiterating my allegiance to Hinduism, I'm consciously laying claim to this geography and history. It's literature and civilization, identifying myself as an heir, one among a billion heirs, to a venerable tradition that stretches back to time immemorial. I fully accept that many of my friends, compatriots, and fellow Hindus feel no similar need, and that there are Hindus who are not, or no longer, are Indian. But I'm comfortable with this cultural and geographical Hinduism that anchors me to my ancestral past. But another reason for my belief in Hinduism is, for lack of a better phrase, its intellectual fit. I'm more comfortable with the tenets of Hinduism than I would be with those of the other faiths of which I know. I've long thought of myself as liberal, not merely in the political sense of the term, or even in re relation to principles of economics, but as an attitude to life to accept people as one finds them, to allow them to be and become what they choose, and to encourage them to do whatever they like, so long as it does not harm others, is my natural instinct. Rigid and censorious beliefs have never appealed to my temperament. In matters of religion, too, I found my liberal instincts reinforced by the faith in which I was brought up. Hinduism is in many ways predicated on the idea that the eternal wisdom of the ages and of divinity cannot be confined to a single sacred book. We have many, and we can delve into each to find our own truth or truths. As a Hindu, I can claim adherence to a religion without an established church or priestly papacy, a religion as rituals and customs I am free to reject, a religion that does not oblige me to demonstrate my faith by any visible sign, by subsuming my identity in any collectivity, not even by a specific day or time or frequency of worship. There is no Hindu Pope, no Hindu Vatican, no Hindu Catechism, not even a Hindu Sunday. As you know, each of the seven days of the week, you can worship who you want. As a Hindu, I follow a faith 
that offers a veritable smorgasbord of options to the worshipper of divinities to adore and to pray to, of rituals to observe or not, of customs and practices to honor or not, of faith fasts to keep or not. As a Hindu, I subscribe to a creed that is free of the restrictive dogmas of holy writ, one that refuses to be shackled to the limitations of a single volume of holy revelation. At the same time as a Hindu, I appreciate the fact that Hinduism professes no false certitudes. Its capacity to express wonder at creation and simultaneously skepticism about the omniscience of the creator are unique to Hinduism. Both are captured beautifully in the, in the 3,500-year-old uh, Rig Veda uh, creation hymn, the, the Nasadiya Sukta. And I won't read the whole hymn. I'll just end with the final verse. Who knows whence this creation had its origin? He, whether he fashioned it or he did not, he who surveys it all from the highest heaven, he knows, or maybe even he does not know. Maybe even he does not know. I love a faith that raises such a fundamental question about no less a supreme being than the creator of the universe. Maybe he does not know indeed. Who are we mere mortals to claim a knowledge of which even he cannot be certain? So that's the beginning of the book and it goes on like that for another 300 pages. So as you can see, I lay out a vision of Hinduism as a liberal faith. It's a, it's a vision that is substantiated with extensive quotations from the sacred texts, with learnings from the great teachers and preceptors of the faith, and at the same time is uh, buttressed by my own views, prejudices, uh, ideas, um, and my, my respect for particular figures who have explained the faith in more contemporary times. I have been and almost lifelong since my teenage years, devotee of Swami Vivekananda. I am a huge admirer of Mahatma Gandhi, whose uh, Jayanti we all celebrate today, his 149th birthday. And I believe these were two, among two, but not the only, amongst the great Hindus who explained the faith uh, in ways that I found immensely attractive and congenial. One of the things that Swami Vivekananda said has always stayed with me. Uh, since I first read it as a teenager, when in that historic address of his in Chicago at the World Parliament of Religions in September 1893, he said he was proud to speak on behalf of a faith that had taught the world not just tolerance but acceptance. Now, I was particularly struck by that because, of course, at that time I was uh, in high school or whatever and I knew that we were all being taught in our textbooks that tolerance is a virtue, that a tolerant king is a just king because he, he accommodates all his subjects and so on. But the more I thought about what Vivekananda had said, the more I was impressed by the profundity of his insight. Because what was he saying? He was saying essentially that tolerance is all very well, but it's fundamentally a patronizing idea. Tolerance says, I have the truth, you are in error, but I will magnanimously indulge you in your right to be wrong. But acceptance, which is what Vivekananda says Hinduism is all about, goes well beyond that. Acceptance says, I believe I have the truth. You believe you have the truth. I will respect your truth. Please respect my truth. <laughs> to my mind, this captures the essence of Hinduism, as Vivekananda had explained it. He's the one who popularized the famous line in Sanskrit, ekam sadvi prabhudabhadanti, there is only one truth, but the sages call it by different names. He also used to cite the Shiva Mahimna Stotram, which says that as many rivers flow in different ways, straight and crooked in different directions to the same sea, so also all ways of worshiping God essentially end up at the same place, and therefore it doesn't matter how you worship. He, he, in one of his five addresses in Chicago, he actually called upon God and said, the God whom we may call Bhagwan or Ishwar and the Muslims may call Allah and the, and the uh, Parsis may call something else. I mean, he basically, and, and some call Jehovah and some call Moses. Well, he just goes on with a list of all the various 
names for God and different faiths to essentially make the point that they're all the same as far as he was concerned. And indeed, this idea of acceptance finds its root in the very deepest and most profound ideas of Hindu philosophy, because when you read Adi Shankara, who did more to revive the faith a thousand years ago, when it was actually facing uh, a, complete, uh, a completely successful challenge from Buddhism at that time, uh, he basically makes the point that we all have a common soul, a common Atman. And there's a famous episode when Adi Shankara, as you know, trudged through the entire subcontinent before the quadrilateral highways existed. Uh, Adi Shankara is said to be, was said to have been walking in Varanasi with his followers when a Chandala, uh, a Dalit we would call him today, somebody from an uh, 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 outcast community, was coming in the opposite direction. And the sage's followers rather brusquely ordered the Chandala off the road, you know, make way for the great sage. But the Chandala refused to make way for Adi Shankara. And he said to him, what do you want me to move, my body or my soul? Why should I move for you? Is not the Atman within me the same as the Atman within you? And Adi Shankara was so impressed by this extraordinary evocation or distillation of the essence of Advaita Vedanta that he prostrated himself before the Dalit and said, you are my guru. Now, this kind of idea is, to me, what makes Hinduism such an extraordinarily interesting philosophy. Obviously, over 300 pages, I go into much more, into much more detail, including some of my own questionings, my own doubts. I discuss my understanding of the issues of caste, of reincarnation, and, and various other, uh, other things. And I've tried to do so, as you heard already, in an accessible layman's style. I'm not a Sanskritist, nor a theologian, nor a scholar of Hinduism. I write as a layperson for lay readers like you, and I hope you'd read it and discover it. Now, I, I, I um, uh, wanted to leave a lot more time for discussion, uh, so let me try and summarize the rest of the book very briefly. Having laid out this um, liberal uh, reaffirmation of what Hinduism is all about, I confront the idea of Hindutva, um, which is wrongly seen by many as a political expression of Hinduism. It is not. It is a political ideology that is very distinct from any Hindu ideas. In fact, those of you who are particularly interested could see an article I published today uh, on the net and which I have put on social media about uh, Hinduism versus Hindutva in terms of Gandhiji's practice of Hinduism and how he evoked and explained the faith versus uh, how the Hindutva ideologues. Hindutva was a political ideology. It was born out of certain global currents in the world in the 1920s when there was a lot of assertion in a very chauvinistic and nationalistic way of race pride and ethnicity. Uh, though Hindus are not a race but a religion, uh, Savarkar, who was not particularly devout as a Hindu, wrote in his book Hindutva about this ideology as being about race pride, he called Hindus a race. And this entire 1920s mentality infects the ideology of Hindutva from the start. And it sees Hindus as a, as, as a people defined by a certain culture and religion who have to assert themselves politically, whereas that last proposition is actually directly contra contradicted by the tenets of Hinduism, which argue that, in fact, all of us can live together in the same space as long as we mutually respect each other. So I, I've gone into this in some detail. I've quoted extensively from the writings of Savarkar Golwalkar, the longest serving head of the RSS, 1940 to 73. And Deen Dayal Upadhyay, who, though he was only um, president of the Jansang for one year, was a general secretary for many years, and was indeed the leading uh, thinker uh, of Hindutva uh, in the 60s and uh, his concept of integral humanism, which has a lot to commend it. There's some very interesting ideas that, uh, that nobody, no liberal-minded person would quarrel with. It also, unfortunately, uh, anchors itself, as does all of Hindutva, in the idea of a Hindu Rashtra. It's no accident that the political leaders of the Hindutva movement and all the principal ideologues consistently rejected the Constitution of India until Mr. Mohan Bhagwat suddenly embraced it last month. Because until then, the position of all these leaders of Savarkar, Golwalkar, Upadhyay 
was that the Constitution is fundamentally flawed for two reasons. First, that it's basically full of imported Western ideas written by Anglophile lawyers in the wrong language, all of which happens to be true and there's nothing we can do about it. And the second criticism, which is far more far-reaching, was their argument that the problem with the Indian Constitution and why it should be scrapped is because it rests on a flawed premise they say the premise of the Constitution is that of territorial nationalism, that India is a territory and all the people on it. Whereas they say that is wrong, a Constitution must be written for a nation, and a nation is not a territory, a nation is a people, and the people of India are the Hindu people. And therefore there should be a Constitution for a Hindu Rashtra alone, and everybody else of every other faith would be here as a guest or an interloper, the guests living here on the sufferance of the Hindus and the interlopers to be treated accordingly as interlopers and denied certain rights. Now this approach, which interestingly enough was finally repudiated last month by Mr. Mohan Bhagwat, rests at the heart of the entire Hindutva project and is to my mind profoundly un-Hindu, almost anti-Hindu in its betrayal of the basic tenets of the faith. Now, the book concludes with, a, with a, um, uh, a plea to take back Hinduism. It, it reviews some of the recent political developments uh, and, and, and explains why it seems to me that this, um, this faith, um, this faith uh, has its own strengths and its appeals if, if it remains true to the principles that I've described in the first half of the book rather than anchoring itself in the bigoted intolerance uh, of, the, of the Hindutva ideology. And then I make a somewhat uh, uh, challengeable claim, no doubt, that this religion as I have described it is in many ways the ideal religion for the 21st century. And I'll read you one more paragraph. In the 21st century, Hinduism has many of the attributes of a universal religion. A religion that is personal and individualistic, privileges the individual and does not subordinate one to a collectivity. In fact, in the book I've described how, whereas in other faiths, you look for God in the heavens, the Hindu looks for God within himself. There is an interiority to Hinduism that makes it very individual. A religion that grants and respects complete freedom to the believer to find his or her own answers to the true meaning of life. A religion that offers a wide range of choice in religious practice even in regard to the nature and form of the formless God. I, I was actually going to talk about all that, the Nirguna Brahman, the original idea of God in Hinduism is rather like the Islamic idea. A God who you cannot imagine, no shape, no gender, no form, uh, God as an idea. Uh, very much the idea of God in Islam today, uh, except that <coughs> in Hinduism, this Nirguna Brahman didn't actually work too well with the followers because in the Vedic years you constantly find people, Hindus, worshipping things they could see themselves or visualize. So rivers and mountains and trees and so on all used to get worshipped, which is why then the, uh, the great sages came up with the idea of the Saguna Brahman, the, the god with qualities, and that was when the notion of Ishwar or Bhagwan was born. But the Hindu sages are very clever. They realized since nobody has seen God in a visualizable form, and therefore none of us knows what God looks like, you should be free to imagine God exactly as you choose. Because every way of imagining God that's true to you is valid, which is a very brilliant uh, Hindu insight. Which means that if you choose to worship God in the form of a pot-bellied man with an elephant head, that's fine. If you want to worship God as an eight-armed woman riding a tiger, that's fine too. And by the way, by the same logic, if you want to worship God as a bleeding man suffering on a cross, that is acceptable as well. So, the recognition that the imaginings of God are essentially about the weaknesses of the human imagination, that we need that crutch to be able to visualize someone or something that we can worship, that is a very interesting insight, it seems to me. And that's why all of us uh, Hindus are allowed to have our Ishtadevta. We choose the God that we want to worship, uh, fully recognizing that we have absolutely no clue that God really looks like that, but that that form is for us an instrument through which we can focus our worship on something we cannot truly 
imagine uh, or see or visualize. Um, a religion that places great emphasis on one's mind and values one's capacity for reflection, intellectual inquiry, and self-study, that is jnana yoga, because worship is about bhakti yoga, but jnana yoga, knowledge, is extremely important, as is karma yoga. Mahatma Gandhi was a great karma yogi. He, he worshipped through, work is worship, he said, and his work is what got him closer to God, and that's a, that's a very, very important Hindu, Hindu way of self-realization. And of course, there's also Raja Yoga, the meditation I mentioned earlier about the interiority. A religion that uh, distances itself from dogma and holy writ, that is minimally prescriptive and yet offers an abundance of options, spiritual and philosophical texts, and social and cultural practices to choose from. In a world where resistance to authority is growing, Hinduism imposes no authorities. In a world of networked individuals, Hinduism proposes no institutional hierarchies. In a world of open source information sharing, Hinduism accepts all parts as equally valid. In a world of rapid transformations and accelerating change, Hinduism is adaptable and flexible, which is why it has survived for nearly 4,000 years. So. I, I'd better leave it there. I could have gone on much longer, but I want to leave us at least 15 minutes for questions and answers. So I will ask you to identify questioners from the audience, and I'll be very happy to respond. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, sir sorry for the stutter. I'm a little nervous. So. Uh, sir, uh, I've read the book. I have research about it. I, uh, wanted, I wanted to ask a very specific question. When, how, and uh, what led to people uh, being more attracted to Savarkar's definition of Hinduism than its original uh, definition of Hinduism? So what happened? Well, first of all, I'm not sure that I would agree with you that very many people were attracted initially. There was a certain current sweeping the world. I mean, the kinds of ideas that Savarkar wrote were exact reflections of the ideas being written by the fascists in Italy, by the Nazis in Germany, by their equivalents in Portugal and Spain, there was a certain current that said, it's time to reassert our muscular might, our nationalism, and so on and so forth. But Savarkar and the party that initially followed him, the Hindu Mahasabha, barely got 2 to 3% of the vote in any election. They, they never had any mass following. If you look as late as 1984, the successor party to that set of ideas, the Bharatiya Janata Party, got two seats. What has happened in more recent years, I think, is a combination of factors. It's certainly the inevitable democratic search for alternatives to the existing ideas that are there. It is partly um, the um, emotive and, I would argue, irresponsible evocation of certain religious messaging through the Ram Janmabhumi movement, the Ram Sheila Pujan before that, and that entire effort in North India to stir up a certain uh, political resentment about history. Uh, there is definitely an element of classic identity politics in some parts of India. Identities were done, were, were, were built up on the ideas of caste. And somebody said, my gosh, if we can create a political movement on the Hindu identity, with 80% of the population, if even half of them come with us, we have, we have got a majority. So all of these things, I think, political opportunism, a certain kind of political mass movement, etc., those have driven it much farther today, and of course it's been allied with a certain set of um, factors, a certain appeal to the electorate, embodied by a very, very charismatic dream merchant who uh, five years ago sold us a lot of dreams, right? And uh, uh, I would say that um, it is not an intellectual acceptance of Hindutva at all. I know BJP MPs and ministers who do not share the convictions of Hindutva. When you talk to them privately, they're even surprised to know what has been written and published in the name of Hindutva. Now, many of them back away. When they read, those of them who have read parts of my book, they say, no, 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 that was all in the past. We're not like that anymore. But they've never officially disavowed it until Mohan Bhagwat's speech a month ago. And even there, there are some real questions about the sincerity of that conversion. So there is a, a, a genuine set of issues around this, but I do not believe that the majority of Indian Hindus buy into Hindutva as these people have defined it. 
Good afternoon, oh, good sir. Afternoon, sir. So, well, we mic. said no mic capturing. So if you've captured the mic, we'll have to give it to somebody. It was given. Good afternoon. Go ahead. <laughs> Ma'am, I was, I was first given the mic. Pardon. Excuse me, sir. Good afternoon sir. from the upper desk. Oh, sir. I want to speak. Excuse me. Who are you? Go. One sec. Go ahead. You. Yes, go ahead with your question. Quickly. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Akshay and uh, I call myself a Tharurian. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so, why is that, that these days, Hindus are being termed as intolerant, unsecular and uh, saffron terrorist and you yourself uh, have said that India is becoming Hindu Pakistan and there are saffron terrorism and um, is it because, min uh, is it for minority appeasement or, and even you, you see the stats, Hinduism has fallen from 80% to 70% what we see now. Uh, is it that Congress has said this for uh, minority appeasement? No, 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 I'm very glad you asked this question. First of all, I have never, ever used the phrase saffron terror or saffron terrorism. Never. You cannot find one single instance ever in any circumstance. I don't believe in saffron terrorism. I don't believe terrorism has any color. I'm proud of saffron. It's one of the three colors on the Indian flag and on my party's flag. Why would I? I would never say. Uh, so terrorism is terrorism. But let us face it, there have been terrorist attacks conducted by people of the Hindu faith as well. But that doesn't mean that it's an overwhelming Hindu phenomenon. It's not. Anyone who understands the Hindu teachings and precepts, since the days of Adi Shankara, who incorporated Ahimsa into the whole philosophy of Hinduism, which is partly from Buddhism and Jainism, Ahimsa has been a fundamental feature of Hinduism, as Mahatma Gandhi also taught us. And anyone who conducts violence is betraying our faith. So that's completely wrong. On Hindu Pakistan, what I said was our nationalist movement divided into two. Not ideologically, divided on the basic principle that one set of people said religion should be the determinant of nationhood. And that's why we ended up with Pakistan. And another set of people said, no, all religions can coexist together. The nation is larger than any one religion. And that was the idea of India. India is a land of all religions. Pakistan is a land of one religion. So I said, if those who are advocating Hindu Rashtra get a chance to make their beliefs a reality by winning the next election, then they will convert India into Hindu Pakistan. I don't believe that India is a Hindu Pakistan or wants to be a Hindu Pakistan. I think these people want to import the idea of Pakistan into India by talking about a Hindu Rashtra. And finally, on the minority, I'm sorry, your numbers are not accurate. Uh, the fact is that uh, the census of 2011 shows us slightly above 80% Hindus. Even if we accept that there is a slightly faster population growth in the minority populations, which is, I think, demographically true, the number will still be around 80 because the numbers we're talking about are 1.3 billion people. We're not talking about, you know, uh, I mean, one of the silly things about, for example, this whole love jihad controversy is you look at how many interreligious marriages you can find in the entire country and you compare them to the numbers of our population, you'll realize that this is an irrelevant issue. It is a completely irrelevant issue. And the same with all the bogey of conversions and so on. How many conversions do you think are taking place in India on the average year? Nobody has given us an accurate figure, but the wildest claims, if you add up all the examples that some groups are changing, will come to 20, 25,000. Let's double it and say 50,000 a year. 50,000 a year means 20 years to get to 1 million. And how many million are we, Hindus? How many years are you going to have to wait before you're actually threatened demographically by conversions? I mean, let's be sensible. We've got this alarmism and fear-mongering going on. Mr. So the, is from the young girl at Mr. the mic. Mr. The, the, the young girl at the mic. I am... What? I am been... Uh, my guardians are Hindus. Where are you speaking from? Here. Here. Now. One minute. It's with the girl there after her. Yes. Go on. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, I'm a first-year bachelor student from Tata Institute of Social Sciences. So, uh, the all-encompassing nature of Hinduism, as you very beautifully praised, uh, from pantheism to agnosticism, is it the result of generations of Brahminical appropriation and Sanskritization? You know, this is, a, this is a good and complex question which requires more time to answer than we have today. 
very briefly, yes, this has been a, this has been a Brahmin dominated faith. But over time, it has had infusions of various kinds of ideas and various kinds of influences. Some of it may have been appropriate. It's very interesting to realize that Valmiki is the son of a hunter. A hunter is an outcast. Ved Asura the Mahabharata, the son of a fisherwoman. A fisherwoman is really as low a caste as you can get. So these are not Brahmins, but their works are revered by Brahmins, right? So it's, it's never been that simple that this is a religion dominated only by that 10 or 11% of one caste. There have been infusions into it from people of all sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of uh, uh, ideas. And today in the 21st century, with the kind of ferment, intellectual ferment, as well as, uh, as ideas and arguments we've seen, plus affirmative action for 70 years, I think for us to reduce Hinduism to a, a pure and simple tale of Brahmin domination, I think is, is far too unsubtle and far too crude. There's much more to be said, but there isn't enough time. I would say I accept the basic charge, particularly historically, but I would argue that the faith has always had many infusions into it and has been evolving very rapidly. Sir, the question Safran is from the floor. desk. Safran, yes. floor, please. Oh, I do have a question I... from... Up from the Tejal, balcony. I saw Tejal Kanitkar's... Ma'am, there was a person there saying his guardians were Hindu. Let's, that sounds yes. interesting. Yes, sir. He's not a Hindu. I am I am Christian by birth. I am an Ainsa artist. I am, my guardians are Hindus. My mother's name is Yeshwadavai. Today, I practice Jainism because of Ainsa. Wonderful. My question is, I am Hindu in culture, but today I feel Hindu in culture is in danger to the saturation level because of cow lynching. The people consume because it is a poor man's diet. How through tolerance we can educate the mob lynching guys? I like to have a good answer from you, Mr. Tarot. I Thank don't, you. I don't honestly don't have a good answer. I have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to my mind, to kill human beings in the name of protecting cows is fundamentally anti-Hindu. It's a betrayal of Hinduism, it's a betrayal of the values we're all taught, and, and I condemn it unreservedly. I believe that an organized state should have the mechanisms to be able to crack down severely on that kind of behavior. There are two or three things that could be done. First is for both political and spiritual leaders to condemn the practice rather than condone it. The powers that be in the last few years have condoned it, have made excuses for the mobs, have tried in some cases to, to uh, get them off the hook, to garland them, God knows what else. We have seen the opposite of the kind of unreserved condemnation that we should want to see of this kind of behavior. Secondly, as far as this is concerned, it seems to me that we also need to have very stringent law enforcement. If anyone knows that whether to defend the cow or not, he assaults another human being, let alone kill him, that he will be severely punished, that action will be taken, that the police will be un themselves under threat of suspension and discipline if they don't take action. If we can create a culture in which the law is strictly enforced, such incidents will decline dramatically. They have been given encouragement They've, to begin with, been unleashed by the victory of certain forces in our country's politics and have been given encouragement by the silence of those who should have stopped them. Yes, sir. The, the lady in the pink kurta. The lady here in the pink kurta. Let's hear from a lady. Let's hear from a lady. Hello, hello. Let's hear from a lady. The lady in the pink kurta. Mine is a very simple question, sir. Uh, can you give me the book you are handling with your duly signed? It's not my cop. I discovered when I landed in Hyderabad that I uh, wasn't carrying a copy of my own book, so I had to borrow someone else's. You'll have to ask her if she's willing to lend it to you. Yeah. Sir, from first floor. Yes, yeah. one from the first floor. Yeah. Hello. Hello, Swami. Shashi Tarunanda Swami. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Chandala, which you and your Hinduism has been referring me for last 2,000 years. Where are you? Yeah, from here. I'm Chandala. I'm Baba Sahib Ambedkar. Great. Great. Well, so, so am I, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I, I also consider myself a follower of Ambedkar, but okay. go ahead. So, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to refer you as Swami uh, Shashitarananda Swami. All right. So, I haven't earned the title, but I will. <laughs> 
except for the purpose yeah, of this sir. discussion. So you, you you born in upper caste Shudra and higher caste, uh, which is uh, in the hierarchy uh, below to the uh, Brahmin. Even after you becoming a Prime Minister or U United General Secretary, you have to touch the feet of uh, a Brahmin. Are you proud of being a slaver? <laughs> That's what my question is. Look, this is a, a, a very complicated <laughs> argument that you've just made. I, I'm not a big fan of feet touching generally. I discourage people from touching mine, and I don't tend to touch others. So but it's, it's saying that right? uh, Shud Shudra has that always to touch the feet of Brahmin, or has to serve a Brahmin. Look, let, let me explain very simply. I understand your objection to casteism, which I largely share. I do not believe that anybody in today's democratic world should be entitled to anything merely by virtue of their birth in a particular caste. And I do believe that merit, opportunity, hard work are all indispensable. I was brought up by those values. My own father walked eight kilometers a day barefoot to high school to study, educate, and make himself and make himself in the world. And he brought me up to respect hard work and to respect as a result, the genuine achievements of human beings. I've never judged people by their caste, upper, lower, middle, sideways, I don't care. I don't ask people's caste, and I will never, ever hire anybody for their caste or, uh, or give anybody unearned respect because of their caste. As far as I'm concerned, individuals earn respect, individuals earn affection, individuals earn contempt. And it doesn't matter what caste you belong to, your performance, your work, or lack thereof, your conduct, your values are what I will judge you by. Thank you very much. Sir, one we, more question. We will yeah. take the question one is more. from only uh, two your left. questions last. There is a, the guy yeah. standing here and one yes, on sir, behalf the of the question, volunteers uh, there. There is Please a question. Sir, my question to you. Sir, my she name is Hercule Singh Munda and greetings from the Transform India Initiative. Little closer to your mouth. Okay. Yeah. My name is Hercule Singh Munda and greetings from the Transform India Initiative. My question to you today is. Over the past decade, we have seen IT boom and startup boom happening. However, there are major components of the community such as cultural practices and languages, which are dying each, every two weeks. So my question to you is, how do you envision the India in the next 10 years in terms of cultural development? In terms of personal development? C culture. In terms of culture. I, I'm not hearing the exact word. My question to you is, how do you see India in terms of cultural development? Cultural development? Yes. Okay, sorry, you were holding the mic a little far away. Um, it's, it's again a vast question to which there's no simple answer. But to my mind, the strength of our culture has always, be, has always lain in the freedom to explore and develop, to actually grow through interaction with other cultures as well as through freedom within its own. Mahatma Gandhi famously said about 80 years ago that he wants India to be a house with all the doors and windows open so that the winds of the world could blow through this house provided we were strong enough to stand on our own feet. That to my mind is still the best metaphor for Indian culture. We have to be anchored in our own traditions but we have to be receptive to the winds and currents that come from elsewhere. Culture is not just dance and music and art, all of which are relevant, it's also ideas. And we should be open to ideas, open to receiving what is offered to us, and to grow through that cross-fertilization. I believe Indian culture is in actually pretty good shape right now. I think the revival of both our classical forms of culture and art, the rediscovery of some of that, as well as the modern experiments with transformative cultures, have been extremely, extremely impressive. And you'll find Indian artists, Indian writers, Indian sculptors, Indian dancers, and now Indian filmmakers also getting huge amounts of respect around the world, being seen as world class. So I'm not at all feeling in any way that our culture is on the back foot. But I would be very much in favor of more encouragement of this, of removing whatever restrictions and restraints our system places on the free expression of culture, of curbing the vandals who would trash a Hussein exhibition without understanding it. I would, I would be in favor of the government only playing the role of safeguarding the free expression of culture, including through things like tax incentives, subsidies, and so on, so that we can actually become a cultural superpower. We really do have it in us.
And the last question by Tejal Kanitkar, our next speaker, uh, speaker in the afternoon. Uh, hi. hi, thank you for your uh, talk. I know you've been asked a few questions on the caste system, but I, I suppose since you've written the book, it has been something that you've had to deal with uh, on a regular basis. I'll ask the question slightly differently. It's related. The way in which you characterized uh, Hinduism is a faith with some form of limitless, limitless agency. How does that square with the rigidity with which the oppression of the caste system continues to play out in, uh, in society today? And does your characterization in some sense not set a dangerous uh, uh, sort of provide fuel to the myth that it is therefore not an imposition? It is therefore simply a matter of choice. Well, it is to a great extent a matter of choice. My, my answer to, the, to you would be that Hinduism as a religion, a, a spiritual uh, pursuit and a set of ideas offers me both the freedom and the tools to challenge Hinduism as social custom. Hinduism as social custom has many things to which I object and which I have never practiced, including respect for caste. But at the same time, I can find you doctrinal evidence to support my approach as much as others can find doctrinal evidence, and Dr. Ambedkar did so, for the blood-curdling casteism, misogyny, and oppressiveness of, uh, justified in some Hindu texts. So, just to give you a couple of examples, there is this wonderful story, of, uh, which I do tell in the book of Krishna and his childhood friend, Utanga. He gives him a boon, that whenever he's thirsty, Krishna will emerge and give him water. Now, this chap cherishes the boon. He's, of course, an upper caste Brahmin. He's wandering one day in the forest, gets lost, starts feeling thirsty, can't find any river or spring or whatever, and he invokes the boon. But nothing happens. He still doesn't come across any spring or river. He's still stumbling on through the forest, feeling terribly thirsty, when this outcast hunter emerges, clad in rags and animal skins, and he reaches out and stretches out to Tanga this animal skin pouch and says, you seem thirsty, drink. And the haughty Brahmin says, no, I can't accept this from you. And the hunter is insistent, but Utanga turns him away, spurns him and moves on. And as he moves on, still stumbling through the far forest, still thirsty, he curses Krishna for having betrayed him, for not having honored his boon. So Krishna materializes before him. And Krishna says, you fool, I sent you when you were thirsty, Lord Indra in the guise of a hunter. And he was offering you not just water, but Amrit, the nectar of immortality. But because you only choose to, chose to see his caste, and you judged him by his externalities, you have forfeited your chance, not only of taking your thirst, but of immortality. Now there is a story which goes to the heart of the lesson that one cannot and must not actually judge people by caste alone. I mentioned uh, other examples, whether it's Valmiki Vedvyas, whether it's a Chandala in Varanasi, whatever it may be, you have a number of examples that justify a non-casteist, anti-hierarchical interpretation of Hinduism. And you can find them in the text. The beauty of a religion without a single, you know, primordial holy text, one which has so many texts to choose from, is that it is genuinely up to the believer to make that choice. So you find the same thing with misogyny. There's a lot of misogynist stuff in, in the Manusmriti. But there's example after example, I've given a few in the book, of women being exalted, worshipped, seen as figures of authority, seen as figures of learning, seen as figures of wisdom, seen as decisive actors with their own agency. Now, if you choose to justify your own prejudices and biases by anchoring yourself to those elements in the ancient texts that seem to justify your position, rather than choosing to find those elements in the text that justify an alternative position, then the choice is still yours. And I would say, don't blame the religion, blame yourself and blame the social practice. You have found it more convenient to follow. So, to my mind, as somebody who is a proud Hindu, I reject many things in the Manusmriti. I reject many things in Hindu social practices. I profoundly question the use of certain arguments in Hinduism. And please do see in the book how I've tried to explore some of these things. I understand that even my position is, is contestable. That, for example, growing up oblivious to caste, as I did, 
completely. I mean, my parents never even mentioned the caste of anybody who ever came to the house, and I was unaware of caste. I thought was the right way to go. I thought that was what Nehruji would have wanted. That certainly my parents were from that independence generation and they believed that one shouldn't think about caste. But then I got a reply from a Dalit blogger uh, who wrote a savage piece and I was suited, 18 year old girl, saying that obliviousness to caste is the luxury of the privileged. That no Dalits can be oblivious to caste. And when, when, I, when I saw that, I realized that, you know, yes, there's something problematic that perhaps I have the luxury to interpret my faith in this way and that not everyone who is part of my faith has the same luxury. So while acknowledging that as, as, as a, a direct answer to your question as to how I can reconcile the one with the other, I reconcile it by accepting the notion of choice and saying my religion frees me to choose from the vast amounts of material. Look, even a thousand years ago, Adi Shankara found there was too much in Hinduism for him to teach. He reduced Hinduism to just a few texts. He just took 10 of the 108 Upanishads. He just took the Brahma Shastras and the Bhagavad Gita, and that to him was Hinduism. He didn't even go into the Vedas. So, and then you take Dayan and Saraswati in the 19th century, who only goes into the Vedas and discards everything else. So you've got actually multiple ways of interpreting your faith. And each Hindu can be true to Hinduism while taking in it, taking from it those principles, those values, those teachings that he or she relates to most and finds most congenial. That is my Hinduism, if I may say so, and that's partly what this book is all about. Thank you all very much. You've been a great audience.